Thank you, Ron. Really appreciate that. It's so great to be with you. I've had such a fantastic time with you all uh, so far this week. And I just want to start, uh, before we even jump in, and just with a little testimony to the power of God active in the world today. I was giving a series of talks in Minneapolis St. Paul on Easter week. And on Friday evening of Easter week, as I was giving a talk, I got a phone call in between two of the talks I gave, and it was my father. And my father let me know that my mother had just been diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer. And uh, he wanted me to pray. And he said, if you could get here, it would be great, because the doctors actually said it's very advanced, and we don't even know if she's going to make it through the week. This is Friday of Easter week, and I, I happened to be with Bishop Cousins, who's a wonderful friend, and I, I pulled him aside before Mass, and I told him what was going on. He said, I'll offer Mass. And, uh, and I just went in prayer, and I said, you know, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but I, I have to be honest. I know that if you ask my mother, does Curtis love you? I know that she would say yes. But I also know that as I lived a, a Catholic life and was a prodigal son and wandered very far away from the church, I broke her heart. And when I became an evangelical Protestant, she was somewhat happy that I had found Christ and very devastated that I had not found the Eucharist. And, and that was more heartbreak. And then when I came back to the church, I was uber Catholic. And so that freaked her out also. And so at every step along the way, I've been throwing elbows at my mother's heart. And I just said, God, you know... You, I can't pray for her to live forever, I know that. But I just, I'm, I'm going to ask St. John Paul for some help here. He, he died, an old man, but his first miracle was to heal a nun of the very disease that he had. And would you intercede with my mother? I know she can't live forever, but I just want some time to be able to prove to her that I love her. Not here, but here. And... Uh, so I flew home Saturday morning, I arranged for a flight Saturday night to fly out to California, and I got on the airplane, and we sat on the, on the, out on the air, airplane for hours, and they canceled the flight, and I was like, oh my goodness, and the next day I got up at 6 o'clock in the morning and got on another plane, and I, I flew, and by the time I got there, she had already gone into surgery, I had missed her. And I just sat there and I prayed with my dad, and uh, he goes, Curtis, it's not good. And... About three hours later, the doctor walked out on Divine Mercy Sunday and told us the cancer was completely removed. And I just spent the last couple of days just earlier this week with my mother with some of the most glorious time of relationship building. So God is active in the world. She's cancer-free, and uh, we're just having some great time. So <laughs> thank you. Just want to take some time to praise God for his great works. So I'm excited about our topic today. We work with some of the best catechists in the nation here. We're so grateful that you're here. Um, Want to look at the, the topic that's becoming to my great delight, and I'm sure yours also. Uh, so much more of a, of a conversation topic. What does it mean to be a missionary disciple or an intentional disciple? The language is still kind of fuzzy, but I think there's this sense of of what's involved in raising up disciples and how does that affect your work as catechists? What does this look like? And I'm excited to spend just a little bit of time with you today sharing some insights that I think God has granted me about what's going on that might be of use to you in your apostolate. And as I think about that, I think about a, a, a teacher who's teaching a course and, and she's up at a, at a whiteboard and she's working away and she's writing and all of a sudden she realizes she's making a mistake that some teachers do. She might be using words that the students don't know and when you speak a language that people don't understand, you bore them. You disengage them. And so she stopped for a moment and she said, oh, um, could anybody tell me the difference between ignorance and apathy? And there's silence, and she said, oh, um, no, seriously, this isn't rhetorical. Could somebody tell me the difference? And there's silence, and she looks around the room, and she looks at her star student, Becky, and she says, Becky, could you tell the class the difference between ignorance and apathy? And Becky thinks for a moment and says, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> Which is exactly the difference between ignorance and apathy. And it's exactly the difference between evangelization and catechesis. If we try to catechize people who don't care, we will bore them. We'll disengage them. In fact, we'll frustrate them. Because you're giving them something they don't want yet. Evangelization addresses the I don't care so that catechesis can address the I don't know. I don't know how to think. I don't know how to live. That catechetical formation. But how do we do this? And it's so important for us to understand that if we get these ordered properly, we'll have great 
great success in what we're doing. And if we get them out of order, well, then we'll frustrate people. You can imagine that somebody said, hey, I've got great news for you. You've been invited to an eight-course meal just a half hour from now. And it's going to be the most spectacular food you've ever had in your entire life. And, and you say, well, that would be great, but I just ate the largest meal I've ever had in my entire life. And I'm actually just not hungry. Your lack of hunger would render that great meal worthless. And we have to recognize that the godless culture within which we live has taken away the desire for people. And it's robbed our young people and people of all ages of the sense of why the church really exists. We work with young people all the time. And they think the church is here to teach us the rules about life. And while there's a certain truth to that, it's a half-truth. If you were to go into any coffee shop and talk to college-age students and say, tell me about the Catholic faith, they would say, oh, well, the Catholic Church is against homosexual marriage, or the Catholic Church is against abortion. They'd have a list of things that the Catholic Church is against. But when you look at the catechism of the Catholic Church, and you look at what it says about itself, what she says about herself in the first article, says this, God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely chose to create you to share in his own divine life who would say that in the coffee shop because that's our message and they haven't heard it and if they haven't heard it and they think we're telling them rules that they don't care about they just don't really know that they want what we have and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend the first part of our time together talking about how, how do we foster that encounter with Christ? Why do we need to do that? How do we do that? And then I'd like to spend just a little bit of time, maybe 10 or so minutes, talking about discipleship, which is the mode in which we should live that out. So we're talking about how do we get started. And my work with Catholics all over the country and all over the world has led me to some really amazing encounters. It's amazing. If you were to test Catholics, they would actually score pretty well on many things. If you went to Catholics, ones that don't even go to church on Sunday, said, do you believe in the Trinity? They're like, yes, which is crazy because they couldn't explain it for more than 30 seconds without falling into heresy. <laughs> you wouldn't do much better, and neither would I. I mean, it's just a, that's just a crazy belief to have, unless it's true. You, you can say, do you believe that the second person of the Trinity became man? And they'll be like, yeah, I even know what day he did it on. <laughs> do you believe that he died for your sins? Yes, I know what day he did that on. They get all these things done, but they don't live any differently than the people who don't believe that. What, how is that possible? Do you believe in an everlasting heaven? Yes, but you're not trying to get there. How is that possible? And they just don't see the connections and why the church is so central and how not just the truths of the gospel, but their response to the truths of the gospel are absolutely essential. I'm convinced that young people today and people of many ages, they, they know the kerygma, at least pieces of it. They, they have those pieces in place. What they don't know is what St. Augustine taught us, which is that there's a city of God and a city of man. And in the city of man... People love themselves so much that they're willing to deny even God and the poor. And in the city of God, people love God so much that they're willing to deny even themselves. And we were born into the city of man, but you could choose to live in the city of God, but you have to choose. And they don't know that their response makes any difference at all. They don't know that they were made by God for a reason, that their life is actually an adventure, and that they're invited to live an adventure, to pursue God, and to come to know who they're meant to be. And as St. Catherine of Siena says, and if they become what they're meant to be, well, they would set the world on fire. Oh, to not know that is a great poverty. And I talk to Catholics all the time, I say, how's that Catholic thing going for you? And they're kind of like basketball players late in the game, they grab their knees, they're like, oh, <laughs> Catholic thing is hard, very hard, very hard. I was talking to one young guy recently, I said, how's that Catholic thing? He's not, it's not going well. I said, are you going to quit? He goes, no. I said, why not? He goes, I don't want to go to hell. 
which is a great reason not to quit. It's not the best reason not to quit, but it's a good reason not to quit. But it's just the sense, and you, and you look at him and say, look, you know, here's the Bible, big book, no pictures, you know. <laughs> Catechism, another big book, four pictures, you know. And then here's all the encyclicals, and here's all the writings of the saints. Go at it. They're like, I don't like to read. And you know, oh, and how do you do that? And, and what I think is that Catholics have the ingredients, but as the more time I spend with ca young Catholics, who are my primary group that I spend time with, the more I... When I look at young people today, I, the Catholic ones, I, I say, they're like a dream house. Could you imagine a dream house? Imagine that I had a chance to build a dream house for my wife, and we dreamed about the location and the place and the house, and, and then with three months left to go, with all the fixtures missing, I said, sweetheart, would you just let me finish this for you? Would you trust me to, to set it up just the way you want? She says, okay. And so for the last three months, I go out and get the fixtures that I know she loves, and I, I put them just where we want, and the house is, is perfect. It's on the lake. It looks out. The sunset, the sunrise are awesome, and we're just, it's perfect. And the workers are finishing up. It's the last of the days, and, and they say, we're done. And they toss me the keys, and I grab them, and I'm like, that's, that's great. And I look at my watch, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, she's going to be here in a few minutes. And the sun starts to go down, and I, I'm walking through the house saying, I think we nailed it. I think we nailed it. This is going to be awesome. And as the sun is going down and I see my wife driving up the driveway with her headlights on, I go to the kitchen and I flip on the lights and nothing happens. And I think, oh my goodness. Um, and I walk into the living room and I flip on the lights and nothing happens. And now I'm freaked out and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we put all this money and all this time and this was supposed to be perfect for my wife. And I run into another room and nothing, nothing's working. All the time, all the planning, all the energy, and it's nothing is working. And then it hits me, wait a second. And I run out in the garage and I open the master breaker and it's off. And I flip it and everything works. Everything works. And that's our Catholic young people. The wiring is all there. They believe all the right stuff or most of the right stuff. It's amazing. I know that you can flip on this switch because our evangelical brothers and sisters are flipping them all the time and our Catholic kids. There was a major evangelical conference with thousands of people at it. And one of the breakout sessions was entitled Catholic Youth, the Key to Our Church's Future. And it wasn't an anti-Catholic seminar. Their point was, Catholics already love Jesus. They just don't know how to follow Jesus. If you could help them to follow Jesus, they'll become the best leaders in your church. They're the key to our future's church. They're the key to our church's future, not just theirs. And the same thing is true for us. All the wiring has been done. They just don't know what to do with it. And so the question is, how do you walk into the soul of a person and flip the breaker? What does that look like? Because as I talk to Catholics, again, I think they've got the data right, but things aren't connected. Jesus teaches us many things in the scriptures, and they're powerful, and they're beautiful. One of them is, is the way he teaches in parables. And in Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, he teaches seven parables, all about the kingdom. And they're, they're amazing, they're wonderful. My favorite is, uh, is the shortest. Not because I'm lazy. Uh, it's just because it's, I, I love Matthew 13, 44, only one verse long. And in Matthew 13, 44, Jesus says this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found, and he hid. And for joy over it, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought the field. And I talked to Catholics, and they have all of the nouns and all of the verbs, but they're all out of order. When you talk to Catholics, so many of them are walking around saying, oh, my goodness. I'm going to sell all that I have in hopes of finding the treasure. But that's not what the parable says. The parable says the treasure was found first. And then for joy over the treasure that had already been discovered, he went and sold all that he had. See, I don't think there's any sorrow or sadness in this guy as he's selling his stuff. I think he's walking around going, want to buy a watch? <laughs> How about a car? Make me an offer. Seriously, I'll sell you anything. Because I know that as soon as I get rid of my stuff and I have the money from that stuff, I can go buy that field. When I buy the field, I win. I, and I've already won because I've already found the treasure. And so I'm just in the process collecting the winnings. 
And because of that, I live from a place of joy rather than a sense of obligation. Is the obligation there? Yes, it's there. But it's below the surface. I don't not cheat on my wife because I don't want to commit a sin. I don't cheat on my wife because I love my wife. I would never want to hurt her. I know that, that she holds my heart in her hands and that I hold her heart in my hands. And I'm very honored that she strives so diligently to care so beautifully for me. And I want to return that favor and love her. There's obligations, but I never thought about it that way. I didn't sit 25 and a half years ago, I did not sit in the sanctuary of Our Lady of the Assumption Church as we're getting married and, and think as I looked across the, the altar, I looked and said, oh crud. I'm going to have to change diapers. I'm going to have to call when I'm late. I'm going to have all kinds of housework to do. I didn't think any of those things. I looked across and said, <laughs> if she doesn't figure out in the next couple of minutes that she's marrying down, I win. <laughs> that's just that simple. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and so I was just so happy. I didn't care about the obligations. I was like, that's, a, that's nothing. Just like the guy didn't care about his watch anymore because it's nothing. It's a trinket. I found the treasure. And so how do we, how do we help people? You know, when I, I tried to write the book Made for More to help to kind of open up the idea to people about how to approach young people and people of all ages, that, that God's calling you on an adventure, that you were made for more. And it was inspired by Pope Benedict on the opening night, of his first mass, that was a night for me when I watched it, but he said something beautiful to young people. He was saying his first mass as Pope, and he said, the, to, to you young people, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. That's so awesome. See, I think that's a message that will correspond with the hearts of anybody who has a pulse. And it's not the message that people hear from the Catholic Church, but I think it's our message. It's the truth. I mean, the truth of the gospel is that Jesus Christ freely chose, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit freely chose to create you because the idea of you so fascinated them. They had no need to create you or me, none whatsoever. But they wanted to share the goodness of their life. And so they dreamed us out of nothing. And they love the idea of you and the idea of me so much that the conception, your conception, occurred in the mind of God. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, from the foundations of the world. In other words, when God said, let there be light, he was thinking about you. And not just some general idea. We'll make a lot of them. No, no, no. He was thinking about you. About the deep intimacies of what makes you angry, what hurts you, what brings you joy, what makes you laugh your weaknesses and your strengths, he knew all of that about you. And at the appropriate time when he fully willed it, the conception in his mind became the real conception of you just under your mother's heart at the moment of your conception. And he loved the idea of you that even though you were wounded by sin, he knew that how awesome you could be and so he was willing to come and rescue you at great personal expense because he knows how awesome you're supposed to be and he knows what's awaiting you. And we don't know, and our young people don't know. And if we don't let them know that, they're not going to care. They're not going to want to sell all they have. So how do we get them to do it? How do we walk through that? And I, one of the ways it strikes me is, uh, and we put this in the, in the front of the book that Ted and I, I only brought two books with me, made for more that I mentioned a second ago, and, um, and the real story. And in the beginning, which we dedicated to Dr. Hahn, who's sitting right over there, and... Um, but we quoted Pope Benedict, and Pope Benedict said this. He said, I am convinced that if Catholics were begin to pray through the scriptures daily, what the church calls Lectio Divina, I am convinced that if Catholics would begin to prayerfully pray through the scriptures daily, it would bring about the new springtime. Wow, what a promise. You trying to figure out how to be more fruitful? Daily, prayerful reading of the scriptures. To seek him. Right? We're promised. If we seek, we'll find. And so what we do frequently, the, there's lots of ways, but my, my preference is when somebody says, well, I, I want to have that kind of encounter. I want to live differently. I want to have that whatever's going on in those people's lives, in your missionaries' lives, and there's a joy, there's energy. I want that. How do I do that? I say, why don't you begin by reading the Gospels prayerfully and carefully? They say, well, what do you mean by that? And so what I'd like to do is just spend maybe a couple minutes with you walking through me praying through the Gospels. So I'm, I'm, I'm going along, this is a, a couple years ago, and I'm, I'm going along, and as you're, as you're seeking Christ in the Gospels, 
don't read it real piously. I mean, be pious, but don't read it real piously. A lot of times we read in the Bible and we read stuff that we completely don't understand. And we're like, yes, Lord, whatever you say, amen, amen. And what, why was that there? I have no idea, but it was scripture. Okay, <laughs> don't, don't do that. Wrestle with God. There's two areas in the scriptures you're going to wrestle with with God. The first one are the things you don't understand. Why is that there? I don't get it. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why is that there? And the other thing that you're going to uh, is the stuff you do understand. You want me to do what? <laughs> I clearly heard you. You want me to forgive who? Forgive how many times? Give up how much? <laughs> are you crazy? I can't do that and wrestle with God. And he will begin to reveal and explain the things you don't understand, and he'll begin to energize you and call you to do the things you understand that don't think you can do, and he'll lead you on adventure. So I'm, I'm reading along, and we're in John's Gospel. I just started John's Gospel, just finished Luke's Gospel, and I'm reading along, and when you're reading, it's good not to not read like Americans. Americans, I, I, when I th read like an American, I'm like, read the Gospel of John, 27 minutes. <laughs> no. No, not, not like that. Slow, prayerful, like a conversation. I'm not a great reader. I, I had dyslexia as a kid. I, I'm, reading doesn't, as an as a enter enterprise on its own, doesn't bring me great joy. I love to read because I read great things. But I don't love to read all by itself. So I have to read great stuff, otherwise I don't want to do it because it's hard. And for many of you, you read well, and it's awesome because when you read stuff, my mom's a great reader, and she's like, oh, when I read, it's like watching a movie. Well, whatever. For me, <laughs> It's like cleaning up the backyard, you know. It's not, it's not fun at all. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm reading along, and I'm, I'm trying to engage my intellect, my heart, my imagination. What does this look like? And in John chapter 1, verse 35, I'll set it up for you. Just the day before, Jesus had come and been baptized. And uh, the setting is this. John the Baptist is out there, and he's, he's preaching, and he's got his group of disciples. And, and there's the, the Pharisees up on top of the hill, and he's, you know, you brood of vipers. And, and there's people coming. It's like... Repent, and they're, they're being baptized. And he's got this growing ministry in these disciples. And all of a sudden, one day, one guy walks down to the water. And, and instead of saying, repent, or brood of vipers, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And all his disciples are like, what? And then he says, I, I must decrease, and he must increase. And they have a little argument about who's going to baptize who. And John baptizes him. And the next day, Jesus is getting ready to leave. And, and the disciples were kind of sitting there going, um, okay, decision moment here. Love John. Thought he was the guy. He made it very clear that this guy's the guy. He's increasing. John's decreasing. He's the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the world. John's not fit to untie his sandals. He's leaving. John's not. What are we going to do? And, and, and so they're sitting there, and as Jesus walks away, two of John's disciples get up and start following Jesus. But they're behind him a little ways. And in my mind, Jesus is walking along, and he's leaving by himself, and, and these two guys are back here, and they're, they're walking along, and then have you ever had that feeling that somebody's walking behind you? So Jesus looks around, and they're like, <laughs> you know, and this goes on two or three times, and, 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 there's, and finally Jesus looks around, and there's this great exchange. Jesus looks back and says, what do you seek? And they look over and say, uh, where, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. And so we're told they, they, they came and they, they saw where he was staying and they remained with him. And it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know what reading the Bible is like for you, um, but it's a wrestling match for me. There's a whole lot I don't understand. There's a whole lot that I do understand that I don't correspond to. This would be one of the ones I don't understand. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Let me explain why that's a problem for me. Because just a couple days before, I was finishing up Luke's gospel, right? And if you just take my Bible and just turn back one page, one page, you have the end of Luke's gospel. Let me tell you what I was wrestling with the week before. This is a setup. It's the road to Emmaus. It's Easter Sunday. And there's two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up. But they don't recognize him. And they're walking along. In my mind, the conversation goes something like this. Jesus says, how's it going? They're like, how's it going? You're walking from Jerusalem. How do you, what do you, what do you mean, how's it going? Are you the only person that didn't hear, hear, hear what? Jesus of Nazareth. 
we thought he was the Messiah. And on, on Friday, they killed him. And they're walking along. I said, yeah, and this morning, the, the body's missing. You've never heard about any of this? And he lets them go. He lets them vent their heart because they're confused and they're, they're in anguish. And he just listens. Sometimes they're like, talk to me. And he's like, no, I want you to talk to me. Just empty your heart. And they walk on, for, in my mind, probably for a couple miles. It's about a six, seven mile walk. So they've got some time. And, th and then finally, after they've kind of let their hearts go, Jesus opens his mouth and begins to speak. And in verse 27 of chapter 24, it says, And beginning with Moses, in other words, the book of Genesis, and beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures and the things that concerned himself. This is the greatest Bible study in the history of the world. And there's not a single sentence about what he said. <laughs> nothing, nothing, not nothing. The best Bible study, nothing. Turn the page, it's four o'clock. Oh my goodness, who is doing the editing in this book? That's crazy. And so I'm sitting there going, how in the world? And here, but here's the problem. You know who did the editing? The Holy Spirit, the author. The primary author did the editing. So it's exactly the way it's supposed to be. And the reason it's frustrating to me is because I'm not exactly the way I'm supposed to be. Which is the great thing about reading the Bible. And receiving the sacraments and allowing sacramental grace and the wrestling with the scriptures. To allow you to become who you're meant to be. And when you wrestle with the scriptures, you will... Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in a day, but you will, you'll encounter Christ. When you encounter Christ, something happens in your heart. It's almost like the Holy Spirit went over and goes, click. Wow, everything starts to work. And for me, as I wrestled with this, why? Why do I not get anything about the greatest Bible study in the history of the world? And why do I need to know that it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a page later? And it hit me. And I, and I don't, that when you're doing Lexio, you don't go on to the next passage. You can read the same passage for weeks if you want to. As, as long as you're drawing grace and energy and fruit and there's a wrestling match going on, you're welcome to stay. So for several weeks, I was trying to do this, and I'm thinking about it during the day. I'm at work, and I'm like, I just don't get it. Why minutia over here and nothing over there? And then it hit me. You know, John's is the last of the Gospels that's written, and he wrote it when he was an old man. And he knew about Matthew and Mark and Luke. And, and John's, John's an old guy, and, and imagine someday he's, he's in prayer as an old man. And he's done so much, and it's now his life is near to the end. And he's in prayer, and all of a sudden he hears, I don't know if it's audible or it's just in his heart of hearts, but he hears Jesus say, tell my story. And I, I imagine he was like, well, Lord, I mean, Matthew and Mark and, and Luke, they did a great job. John, tell my story. And from a very different perspective than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John tells the gospel from the perspective of the beloved disciple. And I can imagine it's, it's like, okay, kind of a big task. How, where do I begin? And in his mind, he goes deep into prayer. I don't know if it was for days or weeks or months, but he gets ready to write, and he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to the very beginning. See, what we don't know from John, but we know from the synoptics, is that the two disciples that were with John the Baptist are Andrew, Peter's brother, and John. And so John, in John chapter 1, is telling you about the first day that he ever met Jesus Christ. And he remembers it, and he's telling the story through all the decades that he's been alive, and he's walking along, and he still remembers the silly conversation. Jesus goes back and says, what do you seek? And they're like, oh, where are you staying? Uh, that was a dumb question. You know, I just, and, uh, and, 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 but he responds, come and see. And, and they, they, so we went, and we saw, we stayed. Oh, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I remember it like yesterday because everything in my life completely changed for the rest of my life. That hour. That hour. And the question that I have for you, and I hope that you'll ask for the people you're working with, what is your four o'clock? What were the moments or moment or moments in which you said, I can never live it again the way I used to live because this has changed everything. This is what happened to Peter on the lake, right? Catch the fish. Oh, my goodness, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Great. Drop the nets. Let's go. And Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. Oh. 
Three times in the book of Acts, Paul's on trial. And they're telling him, knock it off. Stop doing what you're doing. Why are you doing what you're doing? And three times he answers the same way. I was on the road to Damascus. And I met Jesus Christ. He said to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, conversions are what leads to an encounter. That encounter is what allows God to flip the switch so that we can live from a different place. Instead of living for me, even if I'm trying to be a good person, but maybe I'm trying to be a selfish person, but if I'm a me-centered person, I can't be a missionary disciple. I actually have to stand before the Lord, and at some point in time, for me it was my sophomore year in college, and, and to be reading, and for me it was Luke chapter 6, verse 46, and I was reading, and, and I was amazed, and I was reading along, and it's the Sermon on the Plain, and, and Jesus at one point in time in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says something, but in my mind, there was no audible word, but in my mind, I, in my imagination, I heard another word. The, the passage says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? What I, what I imagined him saying was, Curtis, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And I, I, I dropped the Bible on the desk, and um, I didn't have a response, because I did think he was Lord, and I didn't do what he said. And, and I knew something had to change, but I was honest enough with myself to say, well, I'm not just going to say you're Lord, because I know that I have all these bad habits. i got to figure out, either make a, a decision that I'm not going to claim you anymore, or reject all these bad habits and embrace you. And for the next couple of weeks, I, I read the Bible every day. I was praying. I didn't know how to pray very well. And I remember at the end of it, I, you don't have to get down on your knees, but I did. I just got down on my knees and I said, oh. And I prayed the prayer of a prodigal. I said, Lord, I, I've squandered everything you gave me. You gave me a great Catholic family. You, I knew the faith and I walked away from it. I've broken all the commandments. And I'm dead in sin. But if you would take me back, if you would forgive me, which I believe you want to do, then I promise you, you'll be the Lord of my life. I will do anything you ask me to do. I'll, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll give you my life if you'll accept me. I turn to you. And that afternoon, I don't remember the day of the week. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Because I sat there for a while and I just couldn't, and I realized the sun was going down and it was dinner time. And... Um, but it was, a, it was a, a, a watershed moment because later in life, it gets hard to be a disciple, right? And you sit back and you say, so why am I doing this? And you remember the watershed moment. I'm doing this because I know that God is real. I know that Jesus is alive and that he saved me. And I remember that I gave him my entire life. And so now when it's hard, well, I keep going. Now when it's hard, I keep going. And those watershed moments are not the be end all and end all of, of, of Christianity, but they're the, the spark that ignites the fire. There's so much more. The life of discipleship is so much more than encounter, but it begins with encounter and it's revitalized through encounters. And it leads us to accompaniment. To be able to recognize that, that it's people who have had the encounter with Christ, who are living from the encounter of Christ, who then can accompany other people to have an encounter with Christ and to begin to follow Christ and become a disciple of Christ. All the stats are so clear. The most effective way to bring somebody into the church or get them to stay in the church is somebody walks them back in. RCIA doesn't work unless there's accompaniment. Focus doesn't work unless there's a company. There is no program that works if you allow the program to be the solution. The program is the skeleton. You're the solution. I'm the solution. We have to raise up an army of people who are the solution. Because, brothers and sisters, I'm convinced today that the biggest crisis in the church today is that we don't have enough leaders to welcome the people God wants to bring into our church. That we're not ready. I feel like we're living in a moment in the church right now that's not unlike what, we, what was experienced by the patriarch Joseph with Pharaoh. He inter interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, and essentially what he said is, brother, you better build bigger barns. You're not ready for what you're about to take in. You better build bigger barns, because you're going to need this when the, the need arises. Now, the analogy limps, because we're going to have the, the, we're having the, the, the weakness first and the plenty later. But it holds up in the sense that what we need are individuals who can walk those millions, hundreds of millions of people who are outside the church back into the church. And we don't have enough of those people right now. 
to be able to see this. And this is the key thing of how do we do that? How do we raise it up? Who here is in favor of the new evangelization? Hey, who here would like to do twice as much work? <laughs> Where, where'd you go? <laughs> if you don't want to do twice as much work, we better get twice as many workers. That's, there's, oh, that's the only, there's, or just don't invite them. But this is a huge challenge for us, and, and I want to share with you a model uh, that allows us to be able to, to look at this. And so how do, we, how do we do this? It's a model of discipleship. It's the model that Jesus not only taught, he not only commanded, he modeled. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And he could have done it any way he wanted. And in a certain sense, each one of us, if we were honest with ourselves, would actually correct how he did it. Because we sit back and say, well, Jesus, if you came now, you could tweet the gospel. You could fly all over the world. You could, you know, you could have a Facebook page. How many, how many friends you'd have. I mean, we could, all this stuff. We'll build you a web page. We'll do videos. It's going to be awesome. And not, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. They're all awesome. But Jesus knows everything. And he chose to come when he did. And he chose the mode of evangelization Full evangelization, not just the initial proclamation, but the full evangelization of bringing people from that, um, that initial proclamation and that encounter all the way to full participation in the sacraments and a lifelong pursuit of holiness. And that was discipleship. He, I mean, if you, if you follow him, it's kind of crazy. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked when I wrestle with God. I mean, we, how long does it take us to get into trouble in this book? <laughs> right there. Right there. When does he solve it? Almost there. Right there. Oh my goodness, that's a lot of the book. I mean, I would sit back and say, you're the savior of the world. We're in deep, deep trouble. Would you please hurry up? But we're told that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. We're told that so it was the perfect time. And then you sit back and say, well, we're so glad you're here. Hurry up, let's go. And he doesn't appear to be in any hurry whatsoever. He is 30 years old. He's living with his mother. <laughs> oh my goodness. What are you doing? Right? I, I mean, I love my kids. If they're 30 years old and living at home, dude, we're going to have a time to talk. And, and they did. It was called the Wedding Feast of Cana, right? You know, and, and, but it was this, this sense of, oh my goodness, there were, the whole world is waiting for you. You're in no hurry. It took you forever to get here. And you're just dilly dallying around. What are you doing? Get on with it. And I think if you said to him, get on with it, I think he would say, I have been. I prepared the generations through the prophets and the covenants. And, and the last 30 years, the last 30 years I was allowing humanity to experience what it was made for on this earth. Right relationship. See, Mom, St. Joseph and I, we've lived in a little Garden of Eden. And it's spectacular. I wanted to show you what I was hoping to give you. The ability to live in right relationships. I'm going to spend the next three years teaching you how to do it. And I'll spend three hours giving my life so that you'll have the grace to do it. But I, I'm not wasting time. I'm doing exactly what you want. And then if you look at this model, you're like, you got to reach everybody. Um, you know, you should be reaching millions of people. Maybe tens of millions of people. I mean, you got to get busy. And he's got 12. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. What is wrong with your model? It's so counterintuitive, and, and it affects the way we do apostolate because we never go where he goes, or we're always tempted to not go where he goes. And I want to share with you the power of discipleship for just a minute. If you had, you could find somebody who had the gift of evangelization, and they could reach the, preach the gospel in a million people, a million people a year, embraced the gospel and became good Catholics, died and went to heaven. If you could do that, that would be amazing. The, the problem with that is that, as far as I can tell, only once in the history of the world has that ever happened. Jesus didn't do it. Paul didn't do it. Peter didn't do it. Billy Graham didn't do it. John Paul II probably did it while he was Pope. Nobody else has ever done that. So it's a weird gift, right? Not very often. So you're, we're really rolling the dice on like a lotto ticket, right? It's, it's probably not going to come through. And, and here's the second problem. A million people a year? while awesome, won't get the job done. 10 million people a year won't get the job done. 100 million people a year are born every year. A million people a year falling behind 99 million people a year. 
But I want to share something with you real quickly. Imagine if you took Jesus' model, and I'm just going to do the most simple one of Peter, James, and John. And so if I could just have, sister, if you'd be willing to stand up for a second. If I could have somebody in that corner stand up for just a second. And somebody in the back, in the very back row, if you could just stand up for a second. Go ahead. So just please stay standing. This is what Jesus did with Peter, James, and John. J Jesus just went and found three guys and invested very deeply. If you could just touch three people right next to you, and when you're touched on the shoulder, if you could just stand up first, please, and join them. So he went and he spent time, lots of time, with, with three people. Yeah, 12, yeah, 70, but most of the investment in our inner circle. And he spent time with them. And what if you were to work in your, your apostolate and you were to be able to invest in just a few? If the three that were just touched could go touch three more people on the shoulder real quickly. Uh, and stay standing, please. And so now you see that, that those three people that you've invested in, you're not done investing at the end of a year. You're going to keep investing. But after a year of investment, well, then they could actually begin to help other people. And if the three people that were just touched, if you could just touch three or more people and stay standing, that'd be great. And so you work for, let's say, a year. On the college campus, we think a whole year, and we start to work with them. And so now all of a sudden, we we're start to spend, all those people are spending now another year, and they're working with three people, just three. Nobody's doing anything crazy, but you spend a whole year, lots of time hours with these people. You pray together, you work together. If the three that were just touched could touch three more people, that'd be great. And so what you do is you start to see that all of a sudden you're raising up people who could do the very thing that we need to have done. We don't need more faithful Catholics. We need more fruitful Catholic leaders who could actually love people and care for them. Because if we brought more people in, well, we break everything. To bring more people in without being able to care for them it's like a guy saying, I'm pro-life. I've fathered children with many women. <laughs> That's not pro-life. If, if the three that just touched people could touch the, the remaining people, we're going to be done. All right, thank you. If you could all have a seat. What you just did was amazing. What you just did was amazing. You demonstrated the power of discipleship. It doesn't look like you could reach very many people. Three versus a million? But you set up a tidal wave of energy by living the model that Jesus said. He didn't raise up a billion followers. He raised up a dozen or so followers and said, go make more and teach them to do the same. He imparted not just faithfulness, but fruitfulness. And here's the amazing thing. Imagine that one person, not three, but one person Reach two, not three more, but just two. One reached two, and a year later, the two reached four. A year later, the four reached eight. Eight reached 16 the following year. I've done the math. In the 25th year, you would reach 33 million people. That's more people than the person who reached a million. And in the 33rd year, in the lifetime of Jesus Christ, you would reach eight billion with a B people. Everybody. We don't have, we're contracepting. We've got to stop because there's not enough people to evangelize. And so to recognize this is the model Christ gave us and it allows us to reach the entire earth's population in a single lifetime, which is exactly how much time we have because we don't believe in reincarnation. Oh yeah, those poor people in that third world country, when they come back, we'll get them. They're not coming back. We got one lifetime. There has to be a sense of urgency in what we are doing, in what we are doing. And it's going to be hard, but here's the amazing thing. We're not asking anybody to do anything crazy. In the model here, we just ask one person to get to know and love three people. To spend a year doing it. Not be done at the end of the year. To keep loving them afterwards, but to commission them to, to share Christ's commission. You, the way I loved you, go, go love some more people like that. I'll help you, but you have to love them. I can't love them for you. Because you'll hit a capacity. If you've got a great web page, and you had a million people come to it, that's awesome. Who's going to love them? The web page can't love them. But in this model, every single person on earth could be known, loved, and cared for. And every single person would be knowing and loving and caring for others. And if I remember correctly, that's actually what Jesus told us to do. Love God with all that you have, and then love others the way that I've loved you. That's it. We win. But we get distracted from that. And that's what we've been trying to do in focus for the last 17 years. Uh, and it's how we've reached about 35,000 young people during that period of time. And we're continuing to try to be faithful to the model. Uh, and, and it's dependent upon God's grace and the sacraments. And God, at any point in time, if he doesn't choose to bless the model, it won't work. Like a great farmer, you can have a bad year. 
But my conviction is that if we're, if we're faithful to God's command, the last thing he said on earth, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make believers. No, that's not what he said. Make students. Make faithful Catholics. No, make disciples. How do you know you're a disciple? You bear fruit. It's exactly what he said in John chapter 15, verse 8. He said this in John chapter 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. How do you prove to be a disciple? Bear much fruit. When you bear much fruit, what happens? God is glorified, according to Jesus. And I just gave you the model that I, would, I have spent the, my adult life defending is the only model that yields the kind of fruit we're talking about. And it's the only model that will yield the fruit that the people in our world today need. They're dying, waiting for us to give them the message. And when the church becomes who she's meant to be, she'll set the world on fire. People will be knocking down our doors to come to us. And I tell you, as a catechist, it's a lot of fun to catechize people who had the encounter because they can't wait to learn from you. There's no force feeding going on. They're the ones that are calling you at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, you'll never guess what I found. You're like, you've got to call me when it's four, 10 o'clock in the morning. Don't call me now. You can't, they're crazy. They're on fire. You can't control them. You're like, I can't stop them, so I'll steer them. You know, it, it, oh my goodness, we see it on the college campus all the time. Young people on fire for Christ doing the uh, most amazing things. A healthy radicalness for Jesus Christ. And, and see, Jesus didn't call us for a measured discipleship. I believe that you're the Lord of the universe, and so I'm willing to dedicate at least 15% of my time to what you're doing, and I'll agree with at least 80% of what you teach. No. You're it. I'm not. I am all yours. Because remember the parable that I, I, I shared with you a little earlier? Matthew 13, 44. It's an amazing thing. Matthew 13, 44. Because it, what it does is it, it helps us to see that not only is Jesus that treasure hidden in the field, and if, if, if you, if I, the people we're working with, if we were to discover that treasure, well, it would change the way we live. We would live from a, a place of joy, and the obligations that we had, we would gladly undertake for the sake of the joy. That's exactly what we're told in Hebrews was the motivation of Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. But it also gives us the lens. See, the church tells us that there are multiple ways to interpret the scripture, the literal sense but there's spiritual senses, and if you look at the Matthew 13, 44 through a spiritual sense and turn it around almost like a pair of binoculars and look at it through Jesus' eyes, well, then you are the treasure hidden in the field. And for joy over you, he sold all that he had so that he could buy you. The great truth about Christianity is not that we love God or serve God. It's the great truth about Christianity is that God loves you. He thinks you're so amazing. And it's really hard, so you better know that because you're going to hit a point in time where your discipleship and the cost of discipleship and the carrying of the cross is going to be so difficult that you don't know if you can do it. And you have to have those moments, those wellsprings of encounter to come back to. Because discipleship, Christianity is free, but it's not cheap. The cost of discipleship is heavy. I'll give you an example. About 16 months ago, uh, well, I'll back it up. About, about two years ago, I was on vacation. Just about two years exactly, I was on vacation with my wife and our eight children. And uh, we, were, we were out on vacation, and, and uh, I've been blessed with eight children, all girls, and um, except for all of them. I, have, I have actually have eight children, seven are boys and one's a girl. And uh, so we're there with, the, with our, our seven sons and our one daughter, and my wife looks at me, I'm, I'm at the time 53 years old, and she says, uh, I'm pregnant. And I said, that's awesome. And she said, I know, it's a little scary too. And I said, ah, totally, but that's, it's, it's way more awesome than it is scary. And so uh, later that evening, uh, we went out and bought some Martinelli's apple cider and I poured glasses. They all thought it's the last night of vacation, we're having a toast. And I said, uh, here's to the Army, and here's to the Navy. And here's to your mother who's having a baby. And, uh, and, uh, and they, were, they were, it was awesome. And they were all excited. And, and uh, my kids were great. They were, just couldn't wait. And so, so run the clock forward nine months. And so now it's a, a year ago, March. And, and it's the day we're going to have the baby. And, and so we, we come in to have the baby. And, and we, it's the, the delivery goes really smoothly. 
and, and Michael is born. And, uh, and as he's born, we didn't do any tests because we have a, a, a no send back policy. And, uh, <laughs> and so, but as he was born, I thought, oh, he, might have, he might have Down syndrome. And I looked at my wife, and she looked at me, and we didn't say anything to one another. And, it was, and I've been at a lot of births. Did I tell you I have nine kids? And, uh, and I actually delivered Marcus Grodi's third son. That's a whole different story, Scott. We won't go there. Um, but I, so I've been at a few deliveries, and, and I know the joy. The Bible even talks about the joy happens right after delivery. And, and this was kind of a hushed joy. And we were kind of looking at one another, and nobody's really talking. They're checking Michael to see if, if everything's there. And but we're kind of looking, and we're holding him. And you can't quite tell. He's a newborn. And, and uh, I, I think he might have Down syndrome. And I, we waited, and about an hour went by, and I... I turned to one of the nurses, and I, I was trying to respect Michael Ann and how she was processing this, and I said, do, do you think he has Down syndrome? And she says, he, there are some indicators that he might have Down syndrome. And uh, I could tell that Michael Ann just needed some time, and I think she didn't feel free to, to have an emotional response because I was there, and I didn't have a freedom because I, I didn't want to make it harder on her. I would just, it's just kind of raw emotion. And I was like, uh, I was there for a couple hours, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home, and I'm going to make sure the, kids get, the rest of the kids get some dinner, and, and I'll be back in a couple hours. And um, so I walk out of the hospital, and, and I slam the door to the car. I just looked up, and I said, uh, what are you doing? we got eight kids. One with special needs already. We're exhausted. We're trying to serve you. I just don't get what you're trying to do. And in that moment, I didn't hear a word. But in my heart, I heard him say, I'm calling you out on idolatry. <gasps> idolatry? What do you mean idolatry? And he said, remember that afternoon, your sophomore year in college, and you told me I could send you anywhere I want? That you'd do anything I asked? This is what I'm asking. Trust me. And that wellspring immediately changed everything. I was like, I'm in. I trust you. I don't get it. It might hurt. I don't know. And I got to tell you, Michael's awesome. He's just so delightful. He's, he's I, I mean, other eight kids, all awesome, all amazing. I've never watched a kid that can pull joy and love out of people quicker than Michael can. It's amazing. Out of my kids, out of my wife, he's, he's, uh, 16 months old, and my, I was uh, Skyping or Facebooking, what do you call it? Live chat? What's the one on the phone? FaceTime. FaceTime, thank you. I'm old. So I'm FaceTiming my wife, and Michael doesn't speak yet. He says a couple words. Dad, uh, and, um, and I'm, face, I'm FaceTiming Michael, and, uh, and he's like, Dad, 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 Dad. And I'm like, pound it. And I put my fist up, and he put his little fist up, you know. And uh, he's just spectacular. And... Uh, but I couldn't see it because all I could see was the cost of the cross. And I had to go back and trust the God who calls us. And if we don't live in a world where people are living from that, you'll never be able to pay the price when it comes time to pay the price. But to live in discipleship and to call people first to the encounter and then to the accompaniment where you walk two by two, three by three, we walk and create a, a, a tidal wave of spiritual energy in the world, well then we could fulfill the new evangelization. Because, brothers and sisters, if we became who we're meant to be, we would set the world on fire. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father God, we thank you for the great love and mercy that you pour out on us, and the adventure that you call us to, and the world that is waiting for us to be who we're meant to be. Oh God, unleash your grace in the church, in our lives, in ways that we haven't even dreamed of yet. Expand our dreams. Expand our hopes. And then just blow us away how your plan is even bigger than we could imagine. Awaken the church, Lord. We have all that we need because we have you. But recommit our hearts so that we are all yours. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I've got a time for a, uh, a few minutes of questions and answers. I'm going to ask, Christy's right here, and she's got a microphone. So if we could actually, if you could come up, and we would encourage you to form a line so we don't have to wait for people to walk over. Love to take a couple questions with the last uh, few minutes. As we're waiting, uh, I just want to tell you, I, I'm deeply convinced that the catechism, you can't get off of page one before it says, 
moments of renewal in the church are also moments of intense catechesis. And so your work is so, so critically important to the church. But I want to do some Q&A, so I don't see anybody moving yet. Christy's going to have to start making stuff up if you don't come. So I think we've got some people coming. Yes. I just want to commend you for stating that people are well wired. As a catechist for all of my adult life, I've been doing this over and over again, but so often I hear nobody's catechized. Right. Nobody knows anything. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank I you. appreciate you stating that. And those of you out there in the trenches, our people do know their faith. They just don't know how to share it and that's what you're asking us to do and thank you again for that witness right no and as, as you're going i say that I, I completely believe that at the same time when something's completely well wired if one little thing breaks you can you can shut down a whole portion of it and we did experience for 50 years a, a, a breakdown in catechesis which thanks to you and the bishops and other things that's behind us and it's getting better all the time and it redouble your effort but your truth is there. The vast majority of the wiring is there. There's a couple things, little connections, a switch that needs to be, and then it's all done. It's done. But it won't be true a generation from now because the people who are being raised without any catechesis can't catechize their kids at all. they got to bring them to you. So thanks. Yes? Thanks for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any practical thoughts or suggestions for a model of discipleship as a teacher in a Catholic school. Uh, yeah, I actually think uh, that high school, even possibly in middle school, but I think high school is actually the first time that discipleship really begins to work in a way that you can actually raise up peer, uh, peers to do apostolate, where people have made an adult decision. Yes, it's a very young adult decision, but you can actually empower them. It's, it's, it, college is where we're doing it, obviously, but I, I know it can be done in high school because I've met it. We, we had some of our seminarians in Denver implemented our model. They had been focused missionaries. They became seminaries. They implemented the model in Denver. And within two years, they had 85 small groups being run by peer leaders. Ten men entered the seminary in the first year, right out of high school. Um, it, it was amazing to see what's coming on. So I do think we, but the issue is, this is the huge deal. It's leadership selection. We've got to change the way we're doing stuff, right? Right now, it's like, who would like to teach second grade? No experience necessary. Don't do that. You know, I, I'd like to say United Airlines never does that, right? We, we need somebody to teach our pilots, no experience necessary. No, they're serious about training their pilots. You don't have to have the experience to volunteer, but before you get going, somebody's got to train you, got to equip you, and they got to make sure that you are a missionary disciple living from a place of encounter, because if you're not, you know what you're going to teach? The rules. The rules are all true. They're all true. They're not what gives life. They're what protect life once you have it. But what gives life is the person of Jesus Christ and that encounter and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which I then guard the way that Adam was supposed to guard the garden. That's, that's where obedience comes in. So. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, as a teacher, do you have any, and I am the campus minister too, which is, is good, but do you have any practical tips on like what that looks like to, um, to approach a student? For me, it's a little, I'm not sure if I know how to do it as a teacher and to approach a student and say, just how to get that started, basically. Yeah. Do you have anything? It will be a little bit awkward. I have to admit that. It always is. I remember talking to a friend of mine. He's like, I, I like to ask that girl on a date. I don't know what to say. What do you think I ought to say? And I said, I can give you some words, but it's going to be awkward. Um, but you're already not dating her, so the worst thing that can happen is you're right where you are. Uh, and, and when it comes to starting a conversation with somebody about discipleship, our, our, the theme we've had within Focus is it's a little awkward, but heaven is worth the awkwardness. And so what you do is you can share a vision with an entire class or with a small group about following Christ, this idea of becoming who we're meant to be, and say, if anybody's interested in doing that, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you about that. I mean, it's the kind of, a, a, discipleship is an intentional friendship. An example of that would be, hey, let's go run a marathon together. We'll train the next six months. We'll agree that we're not going to eat donuts and we're not going to smoke cigarettes and we're not going to drink vodka and, and we're going to run X number of, uh, of uh, miles a day and we're going to train. And we'll hold each other accountable. And if you see me one day and I'm sitting around smoking cigarettes, eating donuts, you're going to say, Curtis, I thought we were running a marathon. And you'll hold me accountable and have a bad day. And then we'll run the marathon together. Discipleship is an intentional friendship that runs a marathon to heaven. Share the vision and wait for the people to respond to the vision. If you're trying to get them to do it, they don't have the vision yet. Share the vision, allow the vision to motivate them from the inside, 
And then they'll say, hey, I'd like to learn more about that. And then you can talk to them, and they don't want to be nearly as awkward. James. Uh, Curtis, I'm wondering what advice you would have for catechists teaching marriage today. That's great. You know, I, I love catechists who teach marriage because I think they're the best example. There's no, there's no part of the church's teaching that is more amazing, more rich, more robust, more true than the church's teaching on marriage. It's also an enormous amount of teaching. An enormous amount of teaching. And the temptation, we have two major temptations when we teach. The one is the Protestant temptation, the other one is the Catholic temptation. The Protestant temptation is, we'll whittle it down, and they overwhittle. And so they teach part of the truth. The Catholic temptation is, let's teach all of the truth. But that's like trying to drink out of a fire hydrant. I think what we have to do is we have to sell a vision of marriage, and, and, and then from that vision, we can begin to teach as much as we can as long as we have. But from that vision, the vision that we start on college campus is, don't look for guys or girls. Don't do it. What you want to do is fix your eyes on Christ and lay aside every encumbrance and run. And after you've been running for a while, look around and see who's running with you. That's somebody you might want to date. Because now you're on mission together and you found somebody that's already running with you. Don't go there first. And now once I've got an issue of, okay, I want to be a missionary disciple who is going to get married, well, now I want to talk to them about the, the truths of the church. And you set a vision but I'm convinced, James, to take nothing away from all the things that need to be taught, and they, they do, not all of it needs to be taught. I need to teach you how to learn. I need to give you enough so that you know, and enough so that you know how to, how to lead. My son got married last year. He doesn't know everything he needs to know, but he's a self-feeder. Some of that involves calling me up and saying, hey, Dad, I got a question. Some of it involves calling other people, and, 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 or just going to prayer or going to read. So he knows enough. He'll know more 10 years from now. Uh, but he knows marriage is for life, both for life and for life, uh, and, and he's on journey. And the fun thing about that, James, is people have talked about focus as vocations, and we're very blessed. In a, 17 years, 120 women have gone through our program and entered convents. Um, 425 men have gone through our program and entered seminary, and that's awesome. But over 1,000 young people have gotten married, and there hasn't been a single divorce. That's crazy. <laughs> Just time for a couple more, yes. Hi, hey, um, thanks so much for your talk, Curtis. I really appreciated it. Um, I wanted to know specifically, kind of a practical aspect question of ministry, um, women ministering to women and men ministering to men, because for uh, the situation where I work, we have two females who are kind of leading the campus ministry, and so we're working on building up male leaders who can minister sure. to other men, and that beautiful complementarity of the sexes, um, I know that's really important, but I'm wondering if you have any practical tips on on how to, um, how to do that well or the importance of that. Yeah, sure. So we have taken a lot of uh, question over the last 17 years about, you know, why, why, does, why doesn't Focus do more co-ed Bible studies? And uh, it's a great question. We live in a culture that, for the most part, is moving past co-ed into whatever it is called now. Uh, you know, everybody. Uh, and so you've you got this sense. But we really believe, uh, it started by uh, uh, something we noticed and then we've learned something as we went. What we noticed is that when we sent young, attractive, virtuous young people onto college campus, it was very hard to keep the women away from the men and the men away from the women because they were just very attractive. And so we actually implemented a dating fast. So the first year you're on campus, you don't date at all. And, um, and that gave some space. And then once we did that, oh, something really cool came to the surface. God gives us four relationships to live within throughout our life. And they, they come in the order, they typically come in the order that they come in nature. The first one is you're, you're a son or a daughter. And that's been attacked by the devil because of uh, the weakness of fatherhood and the breakdown of the home. And, and it's hard. And part of, of Christianity is restoring confidence in the fatherhood. The second one is to be a brother or a sister. That's also been devastated by our culture. Most young people don't have brothers and sisters. The average Italian young person today does not have a brother, does not have a sister, and does not have a first cousin. They're only children of only children. The concept of brotherly love is gone on a natural level. I've, n I've never been so angry at somebody that I wanted to break their nose, but then when somebody else tried to hurt them, I wanted to break their nose. All of us who have brothers and sisters know that feeling. We're, and, and I could break my brother's nose, but you don't touch him. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, but brotherly love is actually a foundation of what it means to love. And, and so what it, we've done is we've skipped the brother-sister relationship altogether, and we've moved right to sexuality. And so all young people's relationships, all of our relationships have been radically sexualized unless we're clinging to the gospel. 
And so we do gender-specific studies to teach people how to love as brothers and sisters. I don't think that's the only way to do it, and it's not always the way we do it because of circumstances, but we think that's a really important step. Uh, and then the next relationship would be a husband or wife, and then a, a father or a mother, and you walk through life. And there are all those relationships are under attack. But we really believe that if we can, it's best to allow men and women to have space as men and women. You could also do co-ed stuff, but I don't know what your experience is. I, I can tell you, and I'll just get very specific about one issue. When you're doing a Bible study with college, stud college students, you're sitting in a room full of people that are addicted to pornography. Probably every single one of them. At least, at least actively engaged, if not addicted. If you leave that in a co-ed study, you will not be able to address that boulder. I promise you, you separate the men and the women in a matter of two or three weeks, some guy's going to say, I don't know what's going on, but i got to tell you guys, I am in a world of hurt right here. And, and everybody else will be like, me too, brother. Oh, now, light? Now we can get to the sacraments, now we can get support. Now we, oh my goodness, it's awesome. But we've got, there's boulders in our life that the male-female dynamic actually aggravates because you want to you're, you're, be, hey, I've got my act together. And you don't want to be vulnerable. And so we just removed all of that. It's not necessary. We just found it really helpful. Uh, there, there are other ways to do that, I'm sure. Yes? Okay, so something that I feel like has come out in your talk along with many others is the importance of strong catechists and leadership and volunteers and also reducing the amount of teens that you're working with so that it can be more of a discipleship, not you and 50 teens, but you and three teens or 12 teens. So essentially I feel like I'm kind of choosing between the lesser of two evils because I right. can either up my number per good leaders or take a chance with leaders who aren't so great and reduce those numbers. And I was just looking for some advice That's on that. That's an awesome question. And the answer is no. No, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's an awesome, it's an awesome question. But it, this is what changes, is that Jesus worked with the three, but when he, when he went to work with the 12, he took the three with him. And then, and then he worked with the 12, and then when he, when he went to talk to the 70, he took the 12 with him. And then he worked with the 70, and then when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, he never said, hey, you guys wait here, I'm going to go give the Sermon on the Mount. No, he's like, come on, let's go. And he was right with them all the time, and then he occasionally pulled them back. But what he was doing is he was raising up co-laborers. So the issue is you're never saying no to anybody. The most exclusive way you can ever do it is say, I have to have all these people, because you're going to hit a saturation point. Sociologists will say 25, 50, 75, 100. At some point in time, you're done. You actually have no more room in your life for the kind of relationship that could walk somebody back into the church. So that's actually a radically exclusive at a relatively low number. This is open-ended. It says, if I invest in you and we're on mission together, we can partner on this. And now we create open-ended, non-exclusive. So what you do is you get, if you're working in high school, you get your juniors and your seniors and you share with them a vision about what it means to lead somebody one step ahead. And you call them to the next level of leadership, which is peer leadership. And they come alive. Everybody in this room knows that. You love your faith more when you teach it than when you just believe it. But we rob our people of that joy when we teach them exclusively. We've got to raise up teachers. They're not going to be as good at, as, as us, but they can be better than us with time and with the, when the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit take root in their soul, they can be even better. Jesus said that. It's good that I go. Greater things than I, you will do. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I would believe it if, if Scott Hahn told me that, but Jesus Christ said that. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't really believe it. They, but uh, <laughs> so... I mean, that, that's an amazing statement. So we're talking about something that is radically open-ended. It's the most inclusive. In fact, if you run the model and think, how many people, just in your parish or your school, how many people do you really have to reach? Because it's not the people who come. I like to talk to pastors. How, how many uh, of the people are, are your parishioners? Every single person, Catholic, non-Catholic, who lives in your parochial boundaries is your parishioner. You have fatherly responsibility. There's no current pastoral model that will ac account for those, that number of people except discipleship. You're going to have to do uh, that model. And it's, it seems like you're saying no, but you're not. Because if you do it with great love, I, I'm taken by the person of Matthias. Matthias is there. He follows Jesus for, I don't know, days, weeks, months. And then all of a sudden, Jesus goes up and prays all night. And he comes back down and he's like, okay, i got to pick the disciples. Uh, you and you and you. No. You and you. And Matthias is like, oh, darn. And what he didn't do, he's like, oh, I quit, that's it, I'm going home. No, Matthias followed faithfully so that we see in the book of Acts when Judas falls, they're like, okay, from the group that was there from the beginning, let's raise up some people who could replace him. Matthias, wow. 
So we're never saying no, but sometimes we're saying wait. Kind of like when my daughter brings a guy home, right? You know, I'm not saying no, I'm just saying I will kill you if you don't wait. <laughs> so <laughs> first things first, you know? First comes love, then comes... So, thank you. All right, I think we have time for one more. Hi, uh, I'm a seminarian studying for the priesthood. Awesome, and, uh, thank you for being radical. I was, um, I was just wondering if you could speak. Um, how do you think that the priest uh, can support, best support a uh, catechist in his or her parish or in his or, di his or her diocese? Uh, I think that the way that a priest can support catechists is to either disciple those catechists or disciple people who are discipling those catechists. Uh, it is the best way to support anybody um, because no other, no other model will include everyone. There will always be people excluded. And so to be able to see that it is not how much you know right now, if you have had that encounter for Christ and you long to be faithful. Think about John chapter 6. Jesus gives this amazing teaching on the Eucharist and everybody walks away. And, and you know it well, right? This is, this is what it says. Say They all walked away and then Jesus turned and said, uh, will you leave too? And, and, and Peter said, Lord, I think the word you're looking for is transubstantiation. <laughs> right? That's what he's, that's, yours doesn't say that? No, it didn't say that. Peter had no idea what Jesus was talking about. He's like, what? I, where else am I going to go? You've got the words of everlasting life. I trust you. I don't know what you're talking about. But I'm here. Okay, you can teach that person. And Jesus did one year later to the day. We're told John 6 is Passover. And the, and the Last Supper is one year later on Passover. The Jews like Catholics, liturgical people. And, and Jesus takes bread in his hand and said, this is my body. And Peter's like, told you he would explain himself. Told you. And, and, we're, and that's what we do. Fidelity, faithfulness is the key here. Loyalty to Christ. I trust the church because I've given my life to Christ and he, he gave me the church. And so with that heart of a, of a student, well, then what do you do? You disciple them. And, and if you've got that faithfulness, that radicalness to say, I trust you, period, not just with my knowledge, but with my life, well, then I, I can learn and oh my goodness, it's the best time in the history of the world to be a Catholic if you're a teacher. The catechism of the Catholic Church, all the great teachings of Scott and Jeff and the, the, the catechetical program here and the Augustine Institute and Focus, the, the great stuff online. This is the best time in the world to teach the Catholic faith, period. Easiest, best, greatest resources ever. But we're trying to teach people who don't care yet. And so if we just flip that switch, everything we do gets much easier. And so I, we've really been encouraging, I've been very gratified that the bishops are now asking us to go to the seminaries and teach the seminarians how to disciple so that they can learn that process while they're a seminarian. And then we're being asked now to speak at the convocations and start to do training with the priests because they're recognizing, I can't shepherd 4,000 families. But I could raise up a handful of people who could raise up a handful of people who could raise up a handful of people. And you saw how quickly that I mean, we could fill a much bigger room in just a couple more cycles. Come to Defending the Faith. We'll show you. It's, a, it's amazing to see how quickly you reach the world in a very short amount of time. And so I really think, it, I, I'm putting all my marbles there because I don't think when I read the Great Commission, Jesus said, with all the authority in heaven and earth, I'm going to give you two options. Discipleship or programs. He never said that. There's nothing wrong with programs as long as they're building up disciples. But if you're doing programs instead of disciples... You'll never get where you need to go. And you'll be in disobedience to the most authoritative statement ever stated in the history of the world. So if you want to bear fruit, and I, I'll ask this question as I leave the stage, and I want to express it first in a statement. I am overwhelmed with gratitude at the heroism that you exercise on a regular basis. On a daily and week in and week out basis, just love people, and they don't always love you back. You invest in people, and they don't always appear to be responsive to your investment. And I want to stand and, and just declare my gratitude and my awe for your willingness to do that. That being said, if you're going to invest the time and the energy, if you're going to make the personal sacrifices, is there anyone in here who would like to bear more fruit? Yeah, all of us. All things being equal, we all want to bear more fruit. And the model that Christ gave you, I challenge, just intellectually to argue with it. But to put it into practice, the, the model I just shared with you is the single most effective model, bar none, to bear the most fruit.
God bless you.